So I think the, the cost is ten dollars. If you don't have the ten dollars, we'll find a way to get the ten dollars. So don't let that hold you back. All right. So anybody, any man in the church, you're invited to come. We'd love to have you. We've got all the men in church. That'd be great. All right. So it's August the ninth, and uh, be at nine o'clock oh, that Friday night. We ain't gonna stay all night. You know, we'll, we'll probably start heading back about three. So <laughs> hoping you guys will be there before the sun comes up or whatever. So, all right. Thank you.
Amen. Hey, Gary. Let's sing choral stuff. 407. For y'all, please. Thank you for our call.
Gary, it may not go an hour. I, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> but before I come, uh, Brother Randy, uh, who works with the teams on Wednesday nights, he's got a presentation that he'd like to make. So, Brother Randy, if you'd come at this time.
here today. Y'all mind standing up just so we can see all the wonderful dads here? God, God bless each of you. Uh, I tell you what, uh, you're very special men, and I, I know just about all of you very well on a personal basis. I know your life and uh, the, the loving investment that you've made in the lives of your children. And I would just like to say on behalf of the Lord that you really are to be commended. Glad you're here this morning. You can go ahead and sit down, but happy Father's Day to yeah. all of you. Yeah. Uh, hey, Lenny, I see you up there too, man. I was looking down here, but uh, I know you're a dad. Uh, I, how many children do you have? Just the one? Just one. Okay, Matthew. And he's a fine, fine young man. You and your wife did something right there, as did many of our fathers here. Uh, but God bless you. You know, I, you know what? It, this is going to be a little bit of a lighter message this morning. I'm not going to go hard after the dads or anything. <laughs> uh, because I might get under conviction. So that's why we're not doing that. Um, but this is kind of a simple message on Father's Day. I, I've got some, a lot of stories and illustrations. It's not some great expositional uh, treatment of the Word of God, but I'd just like to share a few things with you from the heart today. Um, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, that we read, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. By the way, that's kind of an interesting statement in verse 2. This is obviously taken from the Ten Commandments. And of all the Ten Commandments, this commandment to honor your father and mother is uh, the only one with, with a promise attached to it. And that is the, uh, a life of blessing, a long life, comes from honoring your parents. I'm really not preaching to the dads today, but I'm preaching to the children of, of fathers. How many of you here uh, have, uh, were born of a father? <laughs> okay, I've only got about a fourth of the hands that went off. <laughs> Not to be harsh, but obviously I don't have the accelerating crowd here today. Do I? <laughs> it wasn't a trick question, you know. I mean, no, like all of it. what, Randy? Sounded like it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've all got we've all got dads, and uh, I had a wonderful father. Uh, I, I thank God for him. He went home to be with the Lord about 16 years ago. And that's one of the reasons why, especially the older I get, the more I yearn for heaven. Yeah. I want to see dad again. Yeah. I want to see my dad and give him a big hug. Yeah. Well, let me just share a few things with you. You know, a small boy said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the gift. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, what gift? <laughs> uh, it was a popular comedian that uh, once said, he said, now that my father is a grandfather, he just can't wait to give money to my kids. But when I was a kid and I asked him for 50 cents, he would tell me the story of his life. <laughs> How he got up at 5 a.m. When, uh, uh, when he was 70 years old and walked 23 miles to milk 90 cows and the farmer for whom he walked, walked, uh, worked had no bucket, so he had to squirt the milk into his hand and then walk eight miles to the nearest can, all for five cents. The result was I never got my 50 cents. But now he tells my children every time he comes into the house, well, let's see how much money old granddad has for his wonderful grandkids. And the minute they take money out of his hands, I call them over to me and I snatch it away from, from them because it's my money. It's my money. Someone wrote these humorous, war, humorous words entitled, 
the world according to dad. Uh, this is going to hit home. This is preaching that's really going to hit home now. Uh, these are words that most dads have said at one time or another to the children. The first and the most famous, perhaps, is this is going to hurt you much more than it hurts me. I never believed that when my dad told me. Uh, something else you might hear, quiet, I'm watching the ball game. My kids may have heard that one. I bet Pastor Bob's kids heard that one from time to time when he was watching the Orioles play baseball. I don't know. Now we cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might hear something like, hey, don't forget to check the oil, uh, break back all the change. Uh, how should I know? Ask your mother. <laughs> I'm not made out of money. Uh, when I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school each day, and it was uphill both ways. I heard that from my dad. Hey, you are, you are going, and you are going to have fun. You ever heard that? Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'll do the jokes if you don't mind. <laughs> Somebody out there is stealing the show. <laughs> Have you ever heard this one? Who's paying the bills around here anyway? You hadn't heard that? Come on. Or, you know, if, if your dad's a little bit... In a, if he's in a bad mood, he might say something like this. If you break your leg, don't come home, running home to me. <laughs> uh, don't put your feet on the furniture. Your mother will kill you. Uh, quit playing with your food. Be quiet. Can you see I'm trying to think? And I've heard this a million times. Why? Because I said so. Yeah. Amen. This, this is Amen. good preaching. This is Amen. good preaching here. Uh, Oh, this is another one. If you don't quit that, I'm going to tell your mother. I think mothers say that one a lot. If you don't quit that, I'm going to tell your father. Um, and, and then um, you better get that junk picked up before your mother comes in here. Or this one, just wait. <laughs> I love to say this one. Just wait until you have kids of your own. Have you said that one, Dad? Any of you ever said that? Yeah, yeah if you're honest, you know you have. Uh, what was that, Cindy? Forgot the second part. I hope they act just like you do. <laughs> and then what I've, I've had to use from time to time was this. I, I was not asleep, I was just resting my eyes. <laughs> That's what people usually tell me after the service, by the way. <laughs> I wasn't sleeping, I was meditating on what you were saying. Yeah. Why? Yeah. But, you know, brethren, I suppose we who are fathers could probably add a couple of quotes to this list. Uh, being a, a mother or a father, being a parent can be a very interesting and, and trying experience. Uh, someone once said, parents spend the first part of a child's life urging them to talk and walk and the rest of, the, uh, of his childhood telling him to sit down and to keep quiet. <laughs> One father said of his daughter, what's wrong, Judy? Usually you talk on the phone for hours and this time you only talk for 30 minutes. How come? And Judy said it was the wrong number. <laughs> Some of you didn't get it, did you? <laughs> this has happened, you know, a letter from a college student to his parents read like this, please, please send food packages, all they serve you at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> Another son wrote home to his dad, he said, dear dad, please let me hear from you more often, even if it's just a five or ten. <laughs> 
So both parenting and fatherhood can be a real trial at times, and yet what a real blessing it is. Uh, brethren, we're here today to remember the Lord and honor our earthly fathers, and we need to do both. And I want us to think uh, about some of the things for which we should say, thanks, Dad. And the first one this morning, and I think of my dad, when I think of all these three points that I want to share with you today, uh, if your dad is still living, and, and by the way, I mean, I am preaching to children, but I'm preaching to fathers as well, because you fathers are children to your own fathers. And if they're still alive today, there's probably some things that you need to say on this Father's Day. And the first one is, is this, thanks for material possession. Thanks for material uh, provision, I, I should say. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those, those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Wow! That is powerful. If a father does not provide materially for his family, in other words, food, clothing, and shelter, that he has denied the faith of Christ and is worse than unbelievers. Why would such a father be worse than an unbeliever? Simply because even unbelievers provide for their families uh, most of the time. You know, one, one man's commentary I was reading, he wrote this in there. He said, my dad passed away on December, December the 11th, 1982. If he was alive today, he would be almost 93 years old. He lived to be 72. Dad drove a truck for most of his life. He hauled livestock to and from uh, the Joplin, Missouri stockyards. He hauled logs, cattle, and sheep. Dad didn't make much money, but we always had food on the table and clothes to wear. The old house we lived in wasn't much, but we didn't care. It was old, certainly nothing fancy, and for a long time we had no inside bathroom, but it was home. Dad was a truck driver, not a carpenter. However, when it was decided we needed a bathroom and another room on the old house, Dad built it. It wasn't perfect, but it served the purpose. Dad always took my older brother Larry and me to the barber shop, paid for the haircuts, and when the money was tight, he got out the clippers and zip went our hair, at least it was cool. We didn't have a car when I was small. If we went somewhere, we all piled in Dad's old international harvester truck, a two-seater and no sleeper, and all three kids were on mom's lap. Did I think daddy provided for me? Sure, I did. I honestly don't remember missing out on anything. And folks, none of us, or few of us, may have been wealthy growing up, but I can tell you what, in times were tight for my family growing up, but I hardly ever knew it. My dad made sure that my needs were met. And for that, I'd like to say thanks to my dad today. Um, what about your dad? Did he provide for you? He probably did. And you need to thank him for it if he's still alive today. And so I, I want to give you some ideas today. You may be talking to your dad today. Thank him for the way that he took care of you. And give thanks to God as well that your dad did just that for you. You know, I remember growing up, you know, usually when you're raising children, you don't have a lot of spare money. As you grow older, the children grow up and leave the home, then you're able, maybe, hopefully, to save a little bit of money. And by then, you've bought everything you need to furnish your house with, and things get a little bit easier, but when a family is starting out, a family is young, I mean, things can be tough, things can be tight. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, my dad grew up on a farm, he was one of eight children, and my granddad was a hard working man. He was a master carpenter by trade, and uh, in fact, he was one of the men years ago that helped to renovate Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's old home. 
Uh, he was that good, but he was also a farmer. And I remember my dad got his work ethic young and early in life, and he would have to get up before uh, daybreak. And, uh, well, this, at least this is one of his stories he would tell me, you know, when he was trying to point out how lazy I was. Uh, dad had to, uh, but in all honesty, Dad had to milk cows in the morning before he went to school, and he had to feed it. Uh, the number he told me, I find this hard to believe, but he had to feed 10,000 chickens. Well, I don't know. That's, that may have been an evangelistic exaggeration on my sure this day. But my dad was a hardworking man. He was a little bit of an entrepreneur. He would, he would find things to supplement the income for the family. Uh, there was a time, I mean, in, even up here on the corner at the stoplight, uh, that, that service station, yeah. let's see, no, that's not a service station there anymore. It's uh, a cell phone, what is that, Verizon store? Yeah. yeah, it used to be Longest Brothers up yeah. there. Yeah, yeah some of y'all been here for a while, you remember that. Yeah. Well, my dad had Amen. a popcorn machine, popcorn vending machine out there with the drink machine. I mean, a, he was working the railroad full time. He bought these machines and put them out at various locations. I remember having to go out in the backyard. He had a trailer, and sometimes I'd have to pop the corn. And, uh, man, I don't, I don't know. The Fruit Food and Drug Administration probably shut us down today, but I, I don't, or if that's the right department. But many times I had to pop corn and bag it and so forth, and Dad would go around filling his machines. And, I mean, just anything to provide for the family. My dad, uh, on, on several occasions, not one, but on several occasions, he would go to the railroad in Old Fulton Bottom, I think maybe the oldest railroad yard in the United States, by the way. <clears throat> if not, it's, it's in the top two or three. But over there near, near Williamsburg Road, and my dad would, would leave for work, and it wouldn't be until 36 hours he would come back. He worked 36 hour shifts at times. And I, I can't imagine that. I'm not made of that kind of stuff. But my dad provided for his family. And uh, I got to tell you, I, there's a part of me that envies those of you that have siblings. I was an only child. But there would, there would be one day of the year when I would not envy you at all, and that would be Christmas time. Because yeah. I got it all. <laughs> and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm bad. I beat myself up for it. But there are days when I, I, think, uh, I think my dad that he worked those 36-hour shifts, man, because it paid off at Christmas time. But I had a great dad that way, and many of you can stand up and give testimonies yeah. just like that, yeah. just like that. I was reading a guy by the name of Boyce Mooton. Uh, he's a preacher out in Carl, Carl Junction, Missouri, and he said these words about his grandfather, which I think are appropriate. He said, uh, my grandfather, R.C. Myers, came from Kentucky. He married a Kansas girl and settled down in Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma in 1906. They had 16 children. It never occurred to my grandfather that the government should take care of his family. That was his responsibility. He was a law officer before statehood, but became a sharecropper in order to feed his family. Their poverty did not discourage him from the personal pride of caring for his own. He raised his children without the benefit of electricity and running water. He died without ever having a driver's license. His children nevertheless grew up to be hardworking, patriotic, and devout. I am confident that in spite of his poverty, he did a better job of providing for his own family than the government. Thank God and thank God for all fathers who provide us the best that they can for, for us, their family. And again, I say thank you to your father today because you father sitting here. And again, I know you personally. You did that for your children. And they owe you a debt and a lifetime of thanks because of that. 
They wouldn't be where they are today if it had not been for what you provided them when they were growing up. And we need to remember that about our dads. You younger folks need to remember that about your dads that are in the service here today with you. The second thing we should be thankful for is faithful instruction. Because in Ephesians 6, 4, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let me kind of give you a literal translation of that verse, if I may. It's saying, basically, parents, don't be hard on your children. <clears throat> Raise them properly, teach them, and instruct them about the Lord. Or we can put it this way. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up uh, with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves. And I've said it before, but I, I'll say it again. It's too easy as parents and dads when we get mad to point out everything that's wrong about our children. You will provoke them. You will discourage them if that's, if that's your idea of raising a child. There are times when you have to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Don't get me wrong. But is that all that you and I would would ever do as fathers. Are there ever, ever times when you tell your children what's right about them? Do you encourage them? Because I've got to tell you, it's, it's been my experience, you will get a lot more mileage out of your correction if you focus more on encouragement than you do rebuking. However, the rebuking is at times necessary, but make sure you know, you mix it with encouragement. And before you tell them what's wrong, tell them what's right. Does that make sense? Yes. They will be much more receptive. But if you're always down on their case and browbeating them, uh, they're going to become discouraged. They're going to come uh, perhaps uh, to not like you very much. And they're going to rebel against everything that you stand for and preach in the home. And so we've got to be really careful in, in the way that we handle our children. Uh, you know, fathers, we're told here that fathers need to instruct their children about many things. And by the way, as valuable as mothers are, there's some things that... There's some things whereby a father is better qualified uh, for to instruct their children. And uh, so, and, and God knows that. It takes both a father and a mother in a home to have a great home. And unfortunately, not all of you have that luxury. We, we've got some single parents here that are doing. Uh, an excellent job, perhaps no fault of their own. They're doing an excellent job. And uh, they, they need to be really commended uh, because they've got a tough life there. But uh, single parent, married parents, I, I just thank God for all of you that just love your children and put them first. Put them ahead of yourselves. And, uh, but we need to instruct our children. I, you know, I, my dad used to say a lot of things to me. Uh, pretty much every day, it was either mom or dad that told me to take out the trash. I never did get the hang of that. I, uh, I had to be told every day, it just never, it never clicked in, to check it on my own and take out the trash. But now around my house, uh, my wife has enough other things to do. Uh, I take out the trash every day. And when my kids were growing up, I nagged them to do the same thing. Well, they're gone now, so it's back to me taking out the trash. I remember, I, uh, you know, some of y'all can appreciate this. You know, when things are tight, um, You know, there were some adjusting my wife and I had to do when we got married because we were raised different ways. 
Uh, but she had an excellent parent. But everybody's got a different way of doing things, do they not? And her mother is the type of lady, and it's, it's nothing wrong with it. She liked a lot of light on in the house. Her kitchen light is always on, doesn't matter if she's in the kitchen or not in the kitchen, right? But with, with me growing up, I walk out the bedroom, leave the light on. My dad, if he's not at work, he's sitting there saying, son, turn the light off. I mean, you're burning money. Turn the light off. I go in the kitchen, get something out of the refrigerator, come out of the kitchen. Dad's there. Turn the light off, son. Turn the light off, you know. Man, I am afflicted today with this thing about turning lights off. We've been married for 42 years, and there are times when I still catch myself telling Jane, turn the light off. Please just turn the light off. You're not in the kitchen, turn the light off. You know, she'll come, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down in the den, and she's shaking her head. She knows this, uh, I, this is good preaching now, right? I mean, this is, uh, well, at, at least I've got it. It's not good preaching, but I am telling the truth. That this is how obsessive I am. Yes. So, you know, with no kids anymore, we usually have supper in our two lazy boys in the den, and uh, we don't have a life. We, we just... Every time we watch Andy and Mayberry, Andy and Mayberry, Amen. can't watch Fox News, it depresses me too much. Andy and Mayberry. Amen. And, uh, I mean, we've been through that entire eight-year series, I think about 35 times now, and we still watch Andy and Mayberry. Well, if I'm in there sitting down ready to eat, and she's getting her food, getting ready to come in, if she doesn't turn the light off, she's going to hear from me. Jane, please, just turn the light off. She gets so aggravated with me. I am such a nag. But that was just instilled in me, you know? I can't get away from it. Is that so wrong? <laughs> am I such a bad person? But you know what? Your, your dads did the same thing. You dads have done the same thing with your children. You did what you thought was best. My dad was trying to save money. They were very thrifty, and thus I had to turn the lights off. My dad used to say, Rick, pay attention to what you're doing. I heard that so many times. For some reason, he used to always say that, and for the life of me, I, just, I can't figure out why to this day, you know. But, uh, you know, when my kids were growing up, I would instruct them, you know, not to be afraid to ask questions in school, and. You'll never, never learn anything if you don't ask questions. And like many parents, I'm sure I said this because I know my mother said it to me a million times. I don't care if everybody's doing it. You're not going to do it. Don't be like the crowd. Be yourself. That's good advice, by the way. Amen. You don't need to be somebody else. You're good enough being you. And so fathers have given all kinds of instructions uh, to their children about such things as school, work, uh, relationships, dating, driving a car. When Drew got his first car, it was a <clears throat> Honda. I don't know, it wasn't a Civic, it was a Civic. But anyway... It had four on the floor, you know. It wasn't any automatic transmission. He didn't have a clue. I mean, he was just learning how to drive, and, and but he wanted the stick chip. Uh, he wanted manual transmission. So I remember going out in the neighborhood because I grew up on manual transmission. I had to drive myself to and from the baseball games I was playing in summer league, and Dad had a 1954 retired. Vepco truck. Do you remember Vepco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And an old Vepco truck. It was a three-speed. But man, I can I can scratch rubber in second gear. <laughs> Don't tell my dad. <laughs> but but anyway, I learned on stick shift. I remember going out there and teaching Drew how to drive that, and he picked up on it pretty fast. But dads do that. Uh, they give instruction. One preacher I read said of his father after he passed away, he said, more memorable 
that my household responsibilities were the endless streams of corrections which came my way. Now, you may sound, he may sound critical, but he's actually being grateful here. He said, my, my father never stopped correcting me, but in the right way. Just a short while before he died, he looked at me from his hospital bed and said, why don't you get rid of that paunch? You know, the belly here, paunch. <laughs> yeah, that was his closing word. Why don't you get rid of the paunch? He went on to say, I gave reverence to my earthly father. I was, not af I was afraid not to. He would have taken a belt to me if I dared to disobey. Well, listen, you can't preach that anymore. That's not politically correct. But I, I grew up on a belt. I became very familiar with a belt. And, uh, and that offends maybe even some people here today. But uh, Dad spanked me in the right place. And uh, had, he had a special way of getting my attention. And I don't think I would be where I am today if it was not for Dad's discipline on my life. I needed it. But he goes, the man goes on the right and said, I tried to teach, he tried to teach me anything that would help me in life. And uh, there was another man by the name of Jim Burton that got my attention to. He said this about me and a father. And I mentioned this earlier, and I want to emphasize it once again before I go to my last point. Are you still with me? Amen. Uh, Burton said, a pattern developed, uh, excuse me, uh, Jim Burton wrote, he said, when I was young, baseball was my life. You can imagine the excitement I felt when my oldest son began playing baseball. This game would be one of our main bonding mechanisms. If my son would just listen, I could help him be a great baseball player. Learning to read curveballs, shift his body weight uh, with the swing, steal bases, turn double plays. These things separate the amateurs from the pros. Burton said a pattern developed in our relationship because of my familiarity with the game. I saw every mistake my son made. In addition, uh, I knew how to correct them. So post-game drives home became a critique of how to improve his game. It soon got old for my son. One night he finally said, Dad, could you not start by telling me everything I did wrong? Tell me what I did right first. Brethren, faithful instruction is important, but we have to be careful how we deliver it as fathers. All criticism and no praise is never good. Never good. The third thing we need to be thankful for in our fathers uh, well before I get to that let me just let me just ask you something. As dads are we coaches or just critics by the way? to revisit something that I tried to emphasize before. Because in Ephesians 6, 4, again, Paul literally says, do you remember what we said before? Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. I read a sad confession of one father, uh, kind of broke my heart, but uh, something that he had, he had written. He said, I, I took my children to school, but not to church. I, I, I taught them to drink, but not of the living water. I enrolled them in a little league, but not Sunday school. I showed them how to fish, but not to be uh, fishers of men. I made the Lord's day a holiday rather than a holy day. I taught them the church was full of hypocrites and made the greater hypocrite of them and me. I gave them a color TV but provided no Bible. I handed them the keys to the car and did not give to them the keys of the kingdom of God. I taught them how to make a living but failed to bring them to Christ who alone can make a life. May we as fathers never be guilty of that. 
Brothers and sisters, you need to, if you had a dad that gave you faithful instruction today, if they're alive, you need to thank him for that too. And especially if that instruction included the Lord. Uh, Brother Milton Burchett, I'm sure you're probably watching this online, but uh, thanks needs to go to you. Amen. Because you've got a son here by the name of Gary who loves the Lord, faithful to the Lord, faithful to the house of God, and vital to the ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. Amen. And Brother Milton, Amen. I am sure that is due in large part to your faithful instruction yes. of your son. I wish Brother Ralph Adams could be here with us yeah, today. Yeah, amen. But Ralph, I know where you are. If you can hear me, you deserve the thanks of yeah. three people that I know of. Yeah. Because your children, Lawrence, Dee, and Tina, after all these years, yeah. still come to church. Amen. Faithful to God's house. They still, they still love the Lord. They're still faithful. Amen. In their service to the Lord. Amen. And Brother Ralph, I expect your example had something to do with that. And we have dads like that. To those dads, we need to give thanks. And the third thing is we need to give thanks for godly illustration. Thanks for godly illustration. But this, I mean a godly illustration for life or a godly example for life. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians who were his children in the faith. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1. By the way, can you say this to your children? This is a tough one here. Paul said, be followers of me. Yeah. even as I am also yeah. of Christ. Dad, can you say that? Do you have complete confidence uh, when you tell your children to be followers of me? Yeah. Do you know if they do so, it'll be to their benefit or their detriment? You know, please, you know, notice what Paul said. He said, I don't do everything that I do. But he did say, do everything I do, which is Christ-like. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You watch how I follow the Lord Jesus Christ and emulate that example. I mean, because Paul made some mistakes, did he not? It wouldn't have been good for his children of the faith to follow his example when he made mistakes. And to those of you that are younger here, sometimes you need to lighten up on your parents. Again, one day you're going to be a parent, find out how hard it is to raise children. But I, I don't know, when children are young, they, they expect their parents never to make a mistake, but they're only human beings, they've got a sinful nature. Thank God if they're saved, they've got a divine nature as well. But we've all, and we do all, struggle with a sinful nature. You can read about in the middle of the book of Romans. Paul tells you about that. But man alive, I mean, you know what? You that are younger, again, cut your parents some slack. There are going to be times when they make mistakes. They're not perfect and they're not all-knowing. So be a little bit more compassionate and sympathetic. And I think if we've got dads who made some mistakes by us, but are you with me? Amen. At the end of the day, though they didn't do everything right by us, though they didn't treat us with perfect wisdom in every turn, and my dad didn't, there were things that he did wrong. He was a sinner saved by grace. Amen. But at the end of the day, this is what I knew about my dad. My dad, when it came to me, my dad, in his heart, was always in the right place. Amen. Yeah. And that's what matters. 
And so, getting back to godly illustration, one man said when I was a teenager, Dad would come to my room and say, Go on, kids, let's go. Yeah. And uh, we would ask where to, and he would say to Lucy's. Once a month, Dad would visit, visit Lucy Butchko, mm -hmm. a woman whose body was twisted and pinned into a wheelchair by arthritis. He would reach his big arms around her frail body and lift her out of the wheelchair and place her in the front of the seat of our brown station wagon. Yeah. Then he would fold the wheelchair, throw it in the back, and drive Lucy to the monthly communion service for shut-ins. Dad was... Uh, a vice president of a publishing company who shuttled shut-ins. Later, while in the hospital trying to recover from a massive heart attack, Dad found out that a family down the street didn't have enough money to buy groceries, so he wrote them a check. It was the last thing he ever wrote. The man said a lasting lesson. Godly example, godly illustration. A man I'm familiar with, not on a personal level, but uh, from his commentaries, uh, wrote this about his dad. And it really, I don't know, touched me, got my attention. He said, once when I was a teenager, my father and I were standing in line to buy tickets for the circus. Finally, there was only one family between us and the ticket counter. The family made a big impression on me. There were eight children and uh, mom and dad, and uh, all eight of those children were probably under the age of 12. You could tell they didn't have a lot of money. Their clothes were not expensive, but they were clean. The children were well, were well behaved, all of them standing in line two by two behind their parents holding hands. They were excitedly jabbering about the clowns, elephants, and other acts that they would see that night. One could sense they had never been to a circus before. It promised to be a highlight of their young lives. The father and mother were at the head of a pack standing proud as could be. The mother was holding her, father, her husband's hand, looking up at him as if to say, you're my, shot, you're my knight in shining armor. He was smiling and basking in pride, looking at her. The ticket lady asked the father how many tickets he wanted. He proudly said, please let me buy eight children's tickets and two adult tickets so I can take my family to the circus. And then the lady quoted the price. The man's wife let go of his hand and her head dropped. And the man's lip began to quiver. The father leaned a little closer and asked, How much did you say? The ticket lady again quoted the price. The man didn't have enough money. How was he supposed to turn and tell his eight kids that he didn't have enough money to take them to circus? Seeing what was going on, the man writing here says, my dad, my dad put his hand in his pocket, pulled out a $20 bill and dropped it on the ground. We were not wealthy in any sense of the word. My father reached down, picked up the bill, tapped the man on the shoulder and said, excuse me, sir, I believe this uh, fell out of your pocket. The man knew what was going on. He wasn't begging for a handout, but certainly appreciated the help in a desperate, heartbreaking, embarrassing situation. He looked straight into my dad's eyes as he took my dad by the hand in both of his hands and squeezed them tightly onto the $20 bill and with quivering, quivering lips and a tear streaming down his cheek. He replied, thank you. Thank you, this means, this really means a lot to me and my family. 
brethren, the man telling the story about his father said this. He said, my father and I went back to our car and drove home because now they didn't have enough money for the ticket. But the man writes, he said, we didn't go to the circus that night, but we didn't go without either. And I tell you what, his dad made such an impression on his life that he remembers that story to this day. What a godly deed, what a godly thing to do. As our children get older, will they be able to look back and be and notice those many times when we were an accurate and faithful imitation of God the Father and God the Son. If I could, there's a letter that I would like to send my dad in heaven today. Yeah. He goes like this. There are so many things I'd like to tell you face to face. I either lack the words or fail to find the time and place, but in this special letter, Dad, you'll find at least in part the feelings that the passing years have left within my heart. The memories of childhood days and all that you have done to make our home a happy place and growing up such fun. I still recall the walks we took, the games we often played, those confidential chats we had while resting in the shade. This letter comes to thank you and for needed words of praise, the counsel and the guidance too that shaped my grown up days. No words of mine can tell you that. The things I really feel. You must know my love for you is lasting warm and real. You made my life, my life, my world a better place. And through the coming years, I'll keep these memories of you as cherished souvenirs. Brother Barry, come and lead us in the closing hymn, hymn number 281. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Yeah. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to extend your thanks to your dads today. If you've got a faithful God and dad, they deserve that and so much more.
I hope you'll be back tonight for the evening service. Um, Brother Perry Hill, by the way, will be preaching the evening service. And pray for him in his preparations today. And you're wondering, like, okay, you taking the rest of Father's day off? And then, no. No. Um, I, I mentioned to the folks uh, Wednesday night, I'll be at Good News Baptist Church tonight. And uh, the pastor invited uh, me over there to uh, share some things with, with his people. We have, and you can pray about this, we, we've been meeting together and three other area pastors about a prayer revival in November. And he just felt like uh, Glenn Johnson felt, felt a different voice, maybe would uh, be of some encouragement to his people. So that's where I'll be tonight. Pray that I will be an encouragement to, yeah. to his people if you think about it today. Hey, God bless you folks for being here. It's a good number. It's been a great Father's Day for me and I hope for you already. And as we close in prayer, I'd like to have uh, one of our deacons, uh, Brother Gary Burchett, to close us out. Brother Gary. Well, thank you so much for our calls today. Amen. Happy Father.